Hello, welcome back. This is lecture 28 of our course on advanced quantum mechanics. In the previous lecture, um, we studied how to calculate the density matrix when the system that we're interested in has been in contact with a thermal bath. So for a system in contact with a heat bath. And amazingly, we were able to calculate the density matrix in this case without having to go into the quantum mechanics of the heat bath. In fact, without even having to go into the exact way that interaction happens between the heat bath and our system. Instead, we used information theory, which demonstrates how powerful information theory can be. So no need for the quantum mechanics of the heat bath in order to perform this calculation of rho hat. Instead, um, used information theory. Namely, we found rho hat as the density matrix that uh, maximizes Um, the von Neumann entropy S of rho hat von Neumann entropy <clears throat> subject to what we do know about the system. the system's rho hat. So for example, we knew that the trace of the density matrix has to be one, that um, the energy expectation value of the system is going to be finite, and that the density matrix will reach a fixed point. It will no longer change after our system has interacted with the heat bath for long enough. It has been kicked around so long that no, it has no memory. Or we have no memory of what its initial state was. So by maximizing the ignorance functional, namely the phenomenon entropy, um, subject to the constraint that we do know a few things, we were able to calculate the density matrix already. We did this for a special case, but there are many more thermodynamic circumstances where uh, we have more complicated relationships between a system and its heat bath. And then this information theoretic principle usually is sufficient to calculate the density matrix. Um, this is all um, very useful. And now why, why is rho hat um, here useful? And by here, I mean in the case of a system that is interacting with a heat bath. Now, the reason why it is very useful to have this formula for rho hat that we derived last time, the reason that it is so useful is that every quantum mechanical system is exposed to a heat bath. So every, every, quantum mechanical system is exposed to a heat bath. Mm, you may wonder, what really? Can't I just isolate my system and then it's no longer in a heat bath? No, not really. Imagine the system in question is an atom 
and we want to really isolate it. We don't want to expose it to a heat bath. What do we do? Well, we take our atom, let me write it like this. Okay, so we have our atom here. And what are we gonna do? We are going to put it into a box. And that box is made out of steel, let's say. And we pump it empty so that there's not a single particle in there. And we put our atom in there, however. Then we would imagine that, yeah, our atom is isolated, all right. It's not. It's still exposed to heat bath. And the reason is that the walls of our cavity here, the walls of this box, are at some temperature, which is above absolute zero. But if something is having a temperature above absolute zero, then um, particles will evaporate from that object. So for example, these walls, let's say they are made out of metal, from these walls will evaporate particles. It could be electrons, it could be photons, for example. Um, there's always heat radiation evaporating from any surface of any finer temperature. And therefore, our atom is going to be exposed to that, at the very least, to the heat radiation from that surface. If the surfaces of our box are really hot, well, then there could even be a lot of electrons evaporating from it. <clears throat> but even if the box is very cold and it becomes super unlikely that electrons evaporate, it can still happen, but um, and there's a finite probability, but it could be very rare. <clears throat> but still, photons will definitely evaporate from the box, and this will fill our box with a photon gas which will have the temperature of the box. So therefore, our atom will be exposed to that temperature, to a heat bath of that temperature. Of course, <clears throat> when the box is very, very, very cold, then the heat radiation will be very, very low intensity. And there will be not that many photons around, so to speak. And that means that our atom will be exposed to not so many photons or low energy photons. And therefore, uh, it would be very rare that the atom actually interacts with these things. Also, the low energy photons would have very long wavelengths. And so the interaction will be very much suppressed if the environment is very, very cold. And this is the reason why. Um, in order to perform quantum experiments, we often cool down the location where the experiment takes place. And the same is true for quantum computers. Uh, in many of the currently considered technologies for quantum computers, we cool things down to close to absolute zero, to very cold temperatures, exactly so that um, our quantum system that we want to use for quantum computation is not interacting too strongly with the heat path that it is exposed to. If the heat path has a very low temperature, then we can start to neglect it. So it's always there, but the question is, what is the dominant effect? So after we've covered now heat paths, and have covered the fact that they're always around, I will now move on to, or move back to the situation where we can neglect the heat bath. But now we know what that means. It means that our quantum mechanical considerations have to be, if we do it experimentally, in an environment that's really cold, so cold that the effects that we are interested in are dominant over whatever the heat bath might do. So we will assume that, as we did in most of the course so far, namely that our system can evolve um, freely for a considerable amount of time according to the Schrodinger equation without it interacting with the heat bath and a pure state therefore turning into the mixed thermal state. Now, 
That brings me back, or just let me just mention this um, from now on. We'll assume um, uh, temperature of the environment. Um, to be negligibly low. You will later find out how we can actually calculate what that means, that it is negligibly low for the purposes that uh, we are pursuing here. Okay, so for now on, we will do this. Now, remember, um, Call, um, there is another circumstance where in which we can calculate the density matrix. One circumstance was the system is exposed to a heat bath, and the new circumstance is when we perform a measurement. Call um, second instance where we can calculate, calculate rho hat is um, right after a measurement. <clears throat> Remember the overall picture was this. We had to admit that it's hard to know what state a quantum system is in. And we often can only assign probabilities to what state it might be in. Therefore, we have a mixed state. But the big question is, how do we find out what mixed state the system is in? How do we even find out what probabilities to assign to the various states that the system might be in? One of those um, scenarios, one of those instances where we were able to calculate the density matrix was in the case of a heat bath. And the other case is now in the case um, of a measurement. Concretely, um, assume that we have the following time, consider that we have the following timeline. So this is the time t, and imagine that at some time t naught, we have that the system is prepared in an initial state, psi naught. Oh, and we work in the Schrodinger picture. All of that could be done in any picture, but the Schrodinger picture is the most convenient here. And then we have uh, the Schrodinger equation, or Schrodinger evolution. So evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. Evolution according to Schrodinger equation that goes on until a time that we may call T1. Now, from time T1 until time T1 plus epsilon, something happens, namely a measurement takes place. So, um, measurement of f hat takes place. Um, every measurement takes some amount of time, and let's just say it's a short amount of time. It goes from T1 to T1 plus epsilon. Okay, so what is the state before the measurement? Well, the state here is going to be psi of t. And how do we get psi of t? Well, by Schrodinger equation evolution from psi naught to psi of t. Because our system was undisturbed, we didn't measure it or uh, disturb it in any way. So it just followed the um, time evolution according to the Schrodinger equation. But then we perform the measurement of f hat at that time. And then we find 
um, find outcome. Let me just move this up now. So takes place. Um, so we find the outcome Fn with probability probability for Fn of that's <laughs> okay of Fn is equal to what? Well, let's see. Remember, it was Fn psi of t. <coughs> this is the probability amplitude. And then the modulus squared is the probability for finding the state Fn if the system is in the state psi of t. Let's give this thing a name. This is probability Pn. Okay, so so far we start with a pure state. The pure state is psi naught. The system evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, according to the unitary time evolution operator, until time t1. And this is then where the measurement takes place until time t1 plus epsilon. Um, and the probability for the various outcomes of the measurement um, are pn. I should say that if hat, um, let's assume it to be non-degenerate, ah, non-degenerate and discrete, this discrete spectrum. All of this argument can also be done if there are degeneracies in the eigenvalues and if the spectrum is continuous or has a continuous part. But it's much more efficient to write down if we assume that f hat has a non-degenerate purely discrete spectrum. So we now know what the probabilities are that the experiment, the measurement, that the measurement of f hat will give us um, the measurement value fn. Fn are the eigenvalues, right? And then that means that at time t1 plus epsilon, so therefore at time t0 plus epsilon, um, the system is in state Fn with probability Pn. So therefore, it is in a mixed state. And what is that mixed state? Well, at that point in time, we have that rho hat of t plus epsilon is equal to sum over all n and then the pn and then fn fn. So this is the mixed state that the system is in at that point in time. Now there is a subtle point about this because there is another way of looking at this where you might want to conclude that it's not in a mixed state. After I've done the measurement, after all, you might say, after I've done the measurement and I have found the measurement outcome Fn, well, then I know what state the system is in. It is in the eigenstate Fn. So therefore, henceforth, it is evolving um, as a pure state starting with Fn, right? Um, yes, that's one point of view you can take. But if you do that, you are implicitly doing a switch of ensemble. Remember that in quantum mechanics, all predictions are probabilistic and 
All predictions are not for a single experiment, therefore. All predictions are for an ensemble of experiments. So when we draw this timeline here, then what we should always think of is that we perform this experiment many, many, many times. And every time we perform the experiment, we start our system with the state psi naught. We carefully prepare it such as every time, uh, every, for every experimental run, every element of that ensemble of experiments, we start with the same initial state. Then we have this time evolution for a fixed amount of time until T1. Then we perform the measurement and then we get some outcome of that measurement and then the state evolves after that according to what state if n it collapsed into. So if we continue to use the full ensemble of measurements, uh, so, sorry, the full ensemble of experiments that we perform, if we continue to use the full ensemble all throughout the time axis, then we have to assign here a density matrix that is mixed. If, however, you do what is called a post-selection, which is to say you run a lot of, exam uh, of experiments, a lot of experiments in your ensemble, and then you pick out only those after the measurement, you pick out only those where the measurement outcome Fn for particular n was found. Well, yes, then in that subset of your ensemble of experiments, you have that there's a pure state after the measurement. However, if, and this is what I'm arguing here for, if we do not change our ensemble, but we keep the ensemble, which is to say we run all experiments all the way to the end, from T naught to time plus infinity. In that case, we must take here the, um, this density matrix. For example, at some time T2, um, from some time T2 to some time T2 plus epsilon, we might perform a measurement of some observable G hat. And then if we want to know what is, for example, um, G bar of T2, then we have to calculate this as the trace of rho hat of T2, G hat. Uh, where rho hat of T2 is obtained by following here the evolution, evolution according to von Neumann equation, right? Remember it's the von Neumann equation that describes the evolution of a mixed state over time. So this is the correct formula if we keep our ensemble intact. We never reduce the size of our ensemble by post-selecting for a particular value of the measurement outcome here. Now you may wonder, yeah, that's a bit artificial. Um, in real life, maybe uh, we want to post-select there. True, sometimes you do. And then you're justified in saying that you have a pure state after that. But, in actual real life, this scenario that I'm outlining here is playing out way more times with the full ensemble than with the post-selection. And why is that? It's because whenever in nature two systems interact with each other, then this is happening. The reason is, as we will discuss um, a little bit later, measurements can be viewed as interactions and interactions can be viewed as measurements. They are not completely identical. As we will see, there's a subtle reason for why sometimes you can have interactions without measurements and some measurements without interactions. But these are very special cases and in general, Measurements and interactions are almost exactly the same thing. And those special cases where they are not are super interesting. But for general purposes, unless you tune things super finely, measurement and interactions are the same thing. 
And most interactions are not controlled by us humans, which means most measurements are not controlled by us humans. Most measurements we take place and we never know about them. Let me explain. So, let me illustrate the, what happens here on this time axis, um, this part here. Let me illustrate from here to here. Let's forget about the second measurement. It's just the same thing as the first one. So just from here to here. Let me illustrate that in a different kind of diagram. So imagine we have our system that we are interested in. And that could be an atom, a molecule, or something like that. And then uh, it evolves in time. And there we have our system again, a little bit older. So system prime. And what happens? Well, there is some measurement apparatus. Let's call it M. And that measurement apparatus is initially completely independent of our system. But then that measurement apparatus is kind of interacting with our system. And then we have the measurement apparatus here again and prime. Now that measurement apparatus could be a microscope or it could be any kind of detector of quantum mechanical particles, any measurement apparatus that you um, can think of for any kind of observable. So in the language of the picture that we had above, this one, what's happening here is that we start out with the system in a pure state. Then around here, uh, a measurement takes place and the pure state collapses into a mixed state. And then the mixed state evolves further here according to the von Neumann equation. And the measurement apparatus collects information about our system here through the measurement and then takes away that information. So that's one good way of looking at things. However, the thing is that there is no size limit to how big or how small a measurement apparatus can be. At least we don't know of any size limit. So the measurement apparatus might consist of a big machine. It weighs three tons and costs three million bucks. But the measurement apparatus could also be much smaller. In fact, the measurement apparatus could be as small as one electron. You see, one electron might come along here, interact with our system, and then travel further on. Now, by interacting with our system, the electron learns something about our system. For example, it could learn about where our system is, or how fast it is, or how fast it's spinning, or whatever. Depending on how the interaction takes place between the electron and our system, and depending on what the initial state is of our electron, this electron will learn the one or the other thing about our system, and then it will travel on. You can imagine that this sort of thing happens all the time in nature. Two little quantum systems in one of the cells in your body interact briefly with each other. You can view this as one system performing a measurement on the other. Now, our electron here, in this case, is measuring something about our system, some measurement observable, f hat, and then carries that information away. But we are never going to learn what the outcome of that measurement was. So we can't post-select on it. So the electron measures some information about our system and then carries that information away without us ever knowing about it. Therefore, while at this early point in time, we can assign a pure state to our quantum system, after our electron has struck it and in effect measured it because it has interacted with it, it has learned something about our system, 
the the state of our system will collapse into one of the eigenstates of the operator that our electron happened to measure, but we never know what state it was in. And we never know what the measurement outcome was that the electron learned about our system. So therefore, we have now to say that our system is in the next state after it was struck by the electron. So this is the prototype of an interaction between two quantum systems. And that, of course, occurs much more frequently than us measuring something. So it's important to consider that process here. So what we learn from this is two things. A measurement apparatus could be arbitrarily small. And even though an electron will not bring along for the measurement process here, it will not bring along any instrument, it will not bring along a notebook, and it won't have uh, a Wi-Fi connection to communicate its, its results. The electron simply figures stuff out on its own and then carries away the information secretly. And for us, this means a pure state evolves into um, a mixed state. And this means, secondly, that we cannot post-select, right? Because we don't know what the electron measured, we cannot post-select. Therefore, we have to keep the full ensemble of our experimental runs. Hence, as we discussed before, pure state goes into mixed state. This tells us also Another note of caution. Remember that when we discussed the interaction of a quantum system with a thermal bath, we said it's great that we can calculate what a thermal bath does to a quantum system, but it's not so great that we can't isolate a system from a heat bath. I mean, even let's say we might say, okay, we put a shield there so that our system is not exposed to the heat radiation from whatever other stuff is there that has some temperature. So we put a shield there that it's not exposed to the heat radiation. It doesn't work because the shield itself will have some temperature and therefore the shield itself will radiate heat radiation. There's just no going around it. The only way that you can protect your system from a heat bath is by cooling things down. That is why um, in modern fridges that are used for quantum mechanical experiments and for quantum technology, such as quantum computers, you have fridge within fridge within fridge so that you can get cooler and cooler and cooler. So that the system in the middle is exposed as little as possible <coughs> to, um, to the effects of a heat bath. Well, there's one more reason why we may want to have things cool, and that is in order for example, to trigger superconductivity. That's another reason to cool systems down. But not all quantum technologies um, require such uh, extreme measures. Um, but uh, what I want to say is that we discussed how important it is to protect the quantum system from heat in order for its state to remain pure. Remember that a thermal state is um, a mixed state. The state of a quantum system that's exposed to a heat bath is a mixed state. But when the temperature goes to zero, then the quantum state that the system is in becomes a pure state, it becomes the ground state. And then you can perform unitary evolution on that and do quantum computations and so on. So cooling is the answer there. But what we saw now in the second scenario, in this scenario now where we say, okay, we can again calculate what density matrix a system will be in. Namely, in this case, we can calculate it not because of a thermal bath with information theory. No, now we can calculate what state the system is in right after that interaction. Um, because we know how to calculate the probabilities for measurement outcomes, right? So we can calculate what the uh, mixed state is there. You know, it's, um, this mixed state over here, right, with the PN calculated there. In this scenario, we now also saw that we have to be very careful because even if we protect our quantum system from um, heat radiation, we still have to be careful because any stray particle 
that interacts with our quantum system can make it go from a pure state to a mixed state. And that would be deleterious. For example, if we uh, want to do quantum computation, because uh, for quantum computing, we need complete control over the states. We need to know as much, we need to be as sure as possible that the states that we have are the ones we think we have. The state has to be as pure as can be. So any stray particle, and that just could be a photon or an electron that can learn anything about our system because of its interaction will start to um, make its pure state go into a mixed state, a process that's also called decoherence. And we will study decoherence in more detail, of course, in the next lectures. So, um, let me just say here, caution. Mm. Straight particles can make our system go from pure to mixed. So we don't need a measurement apparatus of a big kind in order to have that collapse happen. A small one can do it too. Now, two big questions arise from these considerations. Namely, uh, question one. Which observable if hat does a stray particle measure? Hmm. Once we know which observable it is, then we can predict the collapse. But we do need to know which observable it is so that we can diagonalize it, so that we can diagonalize its operator, and then we have its eigenvectors, and then, then we can calculate the Pn, right, uh, like this. Once we have the Fn, we can calculate the Pn, and then we know what the collapse is. But yeah, what observable does it measure? As I mentioned, that depends on the state that our stray particle starts in, but it also depends on the nature of the interaction between our stray particle and our system. Okay, so that's going to be one um, question that we want to answer uh, in, in the longer term, uh, not today. And question two is, um, is the collapse from pure to mixed above mm, part of QM, to, of quantum mechanics, or is it extra? Actually, for a while it was thought it's extra, but it's not. <clears throat> um, but how can we understand that? You see, this is a conundrum, it seems. Um, because, so why a problem? Why the question? Well, remember, If a state starts out pure, so let's say if, if uh, rho naught, rho of t naught, let's say, <laughs> no, um, rho naught. I don't want to use the same notation as in the timeline above because it's a separate consideration. So if rho hat naught is equal to, let's say, psi psi, uh, is pure. Then, um, for Neumann evolution, or just quantum mechanical evolution, uh, yields what? 
yields that psi goes into um, u hat of t psi. And therefore, it's easy to see that um, rho hat of t will be u hat of t psi psi u hat dagger of t. And then if we give this a name, if we call this equal to phi, then this is equal to phi. So we have that rho hat of t. So the density matrix at a later time is, well, let's call it phi, phi of t, phi of t. I should really call it psi of t. Yeah, otherwise it would be confusing. So let's call this um, psi of t, and this is psi of t. So this is psi of t. Psi of t is pure. So unitary time evolution according to the Schrodinger equation or the von Neumann equation, same thing really, um, gives us that the density matrix at a later time is pure if it was at an earlier time pure. So that means quantum mechanics preserves purity. Why? Because of unitary time evolution. That can be seen to be fundamentally the reason here. So how come that in these processes here, we have a pure state go into a mixed state. It would appear that this measurement process that our electron performs, or the stray electron performs on our system, um, is somehow breaking quantum mechanics. It's violating the Schrodinger equation, or violating the von Neumann equation. Or is it? Well, it's not. All of this is fine. This can be described within the Schrodinger equations, ordinary unitary time evolution, smoothly. There is nothing abrupt, nothing suddenly happening here. Everything is as smooth here as it is there, as it is there. We just have to do <coughs> something that's a little bit more abstract. Namely, we have to study the concept of Heisenberg cuts. All right. I have to start with the following statement. As far as we know, everything in the universe is described by quantum mechanics or by quantum theory. Everything. We have not seen any exceptions to that. And that means that we can pick out any part of the universe and consider it to be our quantum mechanical system of interest. So let's say this is the universe. Then we can pick any part of it as our quantum mechanical system of interest. And then the rest of it, rest of the universe, we don't describe quantum mechanical, it's just the rest. So for example, this could be one atom that we are interested in, or a particular molecule that we're interested in, or it might be a superconducting crystal that we're interested in, consisting of a gazillion of particles. Or it could be a neutron star. It's a quantum mechanical system. In fact, the solar system is a quantum mechanical system. We can make our so-called Heisenberg cut, and that is this line here, this line here, this line there, the boundary here between what we consider quantum mechanical and what we consider to be the rest of the universe. That boundary line is the Heisenberg cut.
So because everything in the universe is quantum mechanical, we can draw that Heisenberg cut wherever we want. If you wish, you can draw the Heisenberg cut around yourself. And you are a quantum mechanical system, and then there's the rest of the universe. Now, in the case that we are in the situation above, where we had our stray electron coming in from somewhere, disturbing our quantum mechanical system of interest, and then disappearing it into the night again. In that situation, how do we draw that here? Well, above, we had this situation. We had, here's the universe. And then we had our quantum mechanical system of interest. This was um, right like this, quantum mechanical system of interest. And then we also had the measurement apparatus. And the measurement apparatus might be a big and expensive machine, but it might also be as little as an electron or anything in between. So how does this look like now? We have here the quantum mechanical system, and then we also have um, we also have the uh, measurement apparatus. Let's call it measurement apparatus. Okay, M E A A P P measurement apparatus. And what you notice here is that the measurement apparatus is clearly in the region designated rest of the universe. That's where it is. We did not describe that quantum mechanically. No, only our system was described quantum mechanically and the measurement apparatus was acting on it by performing a measurement. But remember that since everything in nature is quantum mechanical, we can draw a different Heisenberg cut. Namely, uh, here's the universe again. We can write here the quantum mechanical system of interest, uh, not sim, sis, system of interest, and the measurement apparatus and then we draw our Heisenberg cut around both of them. So here is the rest of the universe, rest of the universe. Now we could have more measurement apparatuses and those measurement apparatuses could measure our combined system now. But what used to be considered our measurement apparatus, be it expensive or be it an electron. Have you ever considered how cheap an electron is? You can just rub it off your skin for no money. Um, anyway, um, so, oh, our universe is open here. Okay. So, we now have a quantum system which is a larger bubble. The Heisenberg cut is now bigger than it used to be. Okay, so this is our quantum mechanical system now, which means we are going to describe the quantum mechanics of the system that we considered before, plus the quantum mechanics of whatever measured it before. Now, why is that going to help us? Well, let's consider the fact that this is now a system that is not being measured. I mean, we could introduce some measurement apparatus onto that system, but we don't have to. So let's not do it. Then what do we have? Then we have here an independent quantum system, which is unbothered by the rest of the universe, which means that whatever initial state it is in, it might be, for example, initially in a pure state. Well, it will evolve according to its Hamiltonian, which consists of the sum of all the energies involved in here, unitarily 
according to the Schrodinger equation. So therefore, what will happen in here, whatever it is, it's not going to have any state collapse. There's not going to be a pure state going into a mixed state. No, this is one quantum mechanical system. It's undisturbed and it's completely described by the Schrodinger equation. And yet it's the same physical process. Remember the measurement apparatus is still performing its measurement on our quantum system. It's still the same electron that comes in from somewhere, strikes our quantum system and then learn something about it and then disappears into the dark without telling us about it. It's still the case that from the previous perspective, um, our quantum mechanical system starts in a pure state and then after being struck by the electron, it goes into a mixed state. All of that's still happening because we're doing the exact same ensemble of measurements. But now we're looking at this differently. And now we see that from this point of view of the bigger Heisenberg cut, What's going on is unitary time evolution. And what used to be a measurement is no longer happening because there's no measurement in this. If there were a measurement, it would have to be from a measurement apparatus from the outside. No, what's happening in here is an interaction. We simply have one quantum system with two subsystems and those two subsystems will interact with each other. There's going to be a Hamiltonian for this system, a Hamiltonian for that system and a Hamiltonian for the interaction. The total energy of the system has three contributions. Contribution from the system, so it's Hamiltonian. A contribution from that system, so it's Hamiltonian. But also the interaction Hamiltonian, which can contain observables from both systems. So now from this perspective, what used to be described as a measurement, now happens as an interaction. And then you can ask, okay, but the uh, what happened with the collapse? How does the collapse look like now from the perspective of this Heisenberg cut? And it turns out that the, the mathematics of the collapse transforms into the mathematics what is called entanglement generation. This is, will be our next goal to find out um, how that works. Okay, but um, for now, let me just collect a few things that we will have to collect namely um, the total system. The total system um, contains now, um, contains um, the, um, uh, what, all observables. Um, of both systems, both subsystems. So it will contain the F hat of the system acting on um, the states psi of the system, which are elements of the Hilbert space of the system, but also there will be the observables that's called an G hat of the measurement apparatus. It's called MEA for measurement apparatus. And remember that apparatus might be just an electron, um, uh, which, and this operate, these operators, these observables of our measurement apparatus are acting on states that we may call phi, of the measurement apparatus and they live in the Hilbert space of the measurement apparatus. And um, what is the Hilbert space of the total system? Um, Hilbert space of the total system is, and now I have to introduce a new concept, um, and we will study that in great detail uh, in the next lecture. So the Hilbert space of the total system is equal to the so-called tensor product of the Hilbert space of the system that we're interested in, and the Hilbert space of our uh, measurement apparatus. And then what is the 
energy of the total system. And you know, um, and I say the Hilbert space, it's just an ordinary Hilbert space. The total system is just an ordinary quantum system, right? So there's nothing new to be learned about that Hilbert space or the observables of the larger uh, quantum mechanical system because it's just another quantum mechanical system. And <clears throat> the only non-trivial part that we will have to study here is how to compose two subsystems to one total system. How do they relate to each other? So the energy of the total system is then what? It turns out that the Hamiltonian of the total system, so therefore the energy of the total system, and remember, whenever we set up a quantum system, the first thing we should ask is, what is its total energy? Because if you remember back from the very first lecture, Hamilton discovered that if you know the expression for the energy of a, of a system, then you know everything about it. Because from the energy, the equations of motion and everything else follows. So we need to ask, what's the energy of the total system? What's the total system's Hamiltonian? And it turns out it is the Hamiltonian of the system that we were interested in, tensor product with the identity operator on the second Hilbert space plus identity uh, operator tensor the Hamiltonian, which is the total energy of our measurement apparatus plus, and this is crucial, is going to be an interaction Hamiltonian. And this one acts on both H1 tensor H2. You see, the Hamiltonian of the system acts only on the Hilbert space of the system. That's why we need to, to do a tensor one because it acts as the identity operator on the Hilbert space of the measurement apparatus. On the other hand, the Hamiltonian of the measurement apparatus acts on its Hilbert space. So we have to do a tensor one to make the whole thing act on the total Hilbert space, because the total Hamiltonian has to act on the total Hilbert space. And the H interaction Hamiltonian is naturally a Hamiltonian that acts on both Hilbert spaces. That's important because that means that this Hamiltonian, as we will see later, has the ability to entangle the system and the measurement apparatus. And it is this process of entangling the two systems that performs in the previous picture of the Heisenberg cut, that performs the measurement, that performs the, the state collapse. Except that now with this bigger Heisenberg cut, Heisenberg cut, there is no longer any collapse, the whole thing evolves unitarily. So it's beautiful. The same physical process can be described as either being unitary, no collapse, from, for the bigger Heisenberg cut, Heisenberg cut, or with a smaller Heisenberg cut, it is happening with collapse non-unitarily. And we can calculate from the bigger system's perspective, with the bigger Heisenberg cut, exactly how the collapse, how the transition from a pure state to a mixed state happens dynamically in a smooth fashion, just by the ordinary uh, Schrodinger uh, evolution. And in the process, you will see that uh, the, the uh, the um, process of measurement is essentially a process of interaction and interactions are essentially processes of measurement, um, except for extreme circumstances where we can have interactions without measurements and measurements without interactions, as we will see later. But you see where this is going? What we next need to do is define what we mean by the tensor product symbol. What on earth is this? I'm assuming you've seen it before, but can you write down the axioms for it? We need the axioms to be on solid footing because only once we have the axioms that define what the tensor product is, then we know exactly what rules apply to the tensor product. How does the tensor product of two operators work? How does the tensor product of two vectors work? How does the tensor product of two Hilbert spaces work? We need to know exactly what the rules of the game are. And once we can do that, 
then we can perform this calculation of the bigger system. And, well, it, as I explained it today, the purpose of going to a bigger system is to understand the interactions as measurements, measurements as interactions, understanding how that collapse happens and so on. But of course, the ability to compose quantum systems, to get bigger quantum systems is important way beyond that. You know, any molecule um, is composed of subsystems and it's important to be able to view a quantum system as being composed of smaller subsystems. Also, when, for example, two molecules interact in a chemical reaction to form a new molecule, then you have two quantum systems forming one quantum system. It's good to uh, study that from the perspective of bigger quantum systems and their subsystems. All right, so that's next what we will do, namely study how subsystems can be combined to form a bigger system, what's the mass behind it, and, um, and so on. Okay, this is as far as we got today.